So <clears throat> my name is Hari Bath. Uh, I head up SecDevOps at Barclays in the Chief Security Office. I've been with Barclays for about 13 years. And uh, my name is Richard Hughes. That's my younger me. Everyone likes to have younger photos, don't they? It's a good opportunity. Um, I run, I'm a platform engineering director and uh, I lead a number of technologies in my team. Um, I'm privileged to have a highly skilled team in Kubernetes, Linux, Kafka, and obviously Vault is one of the disciplines that I personally am involved in. Um, PKI also, by the way, I'll try and touch on today because it's been quite one of our successes. Excellent. <coughs> and how long have you been with Barclays? Oh, I've been a long time. I don't even want to say. So yeah, a long, long time. <laughs> right. Cool. Uh, excellent. So uh, we are going to try not to match the uh, humorous um, sort of you know take on the previous um, <coughs> presentations because we can't match it. So uh, it is you know um, it's going to be a difficult task enough as it is to keep you guys awake after lunch. So that's what we're going to focus on. I'll take that as a um, <clears throat> a personal win if we don't have anybody falling asleep on us. So agenda, what we're going to talk about is uh, a high-level business pro uh, problem, what we're trying to solve from a secrets management perspective, what the technology challenges. I'll give you an example. I'll work through an example with you guys. Hopefully, you guys will be able to identify with that. I'll ask you to raise your hands um, at the end of that example to say whether that's something that resonates with, the, with, with most of you or not. <clears throat> um, and then what should target state look like? Rich is going to cover that. And then gotchas and stuff, what sort of you know, things that we should um, watch out for during um, this journey. And then kind of you know, what should the end state look like? What can you expect to achieve by going on this journey? Right? Hopefully that makes sense. So what is kind of a traditional secret management life cycle. Um, what happens is traditionally in the on-prem world, what you have done is you, we have grown up with secrets which are managed on-prem for on-prem applications, which are form you have to fill in. The form has to go to a certain team. The, the admin team uh, provisions the secrets and sends that back to developers somehow and then and the developers of the application architects or infra architects kind of set up the environment, long lived infrastructure, and then they deploy the application and everything works. Uh, <clears throat> and that's kind of where we were. And then you move to sort of public cloud, you follow a different process. Now that you have introduced public cloud, um, you have to fill a different form, it goes to a different team different approval groups, et cetera, et cetera. You get the idea. And then you sort of, you know, have a private cloud, or it should be reversed. Actually, you go to private cloud first and then public cloud. But the idea is you have cognitive load on your developers where they have to figure out what forms, what processes they must follow in order to get their applications working on different platforms, right? And that's kind of the complexity that we sort of want to highlight here. <coughs> Um, so you move, so this is the secret creation problem. So how does a secret get created in the first place? And then you move to the st secret storage problem. Um, traditionally, we've had um, certain type of vaults to store the secrets. Then you have to figure out whether the vault is secure enough. Are you using what are you using for your applications to authenticate to the vault to get the secrets out? How do you do that? And then um, you have to look at all of these things about and answer the questions about uh, who has uh, the keys and the access to the secrets? Uh, how are they consuming those secrets? Are the secrets um, being seen by somebody that's not allowed to see them, right? And that kind of you know, moves us into the governance issue. And in highly regulated financial institutions like ours, Kind of, you know, that's where the buck stops, right? We have to sort of, you know, um, um, we have to be able to demonstrate to our regulators that we are in control of our risk position and that sort of, you know, all of this um, uh, sort of proves, sort of provides the way for us to achieve those compliances. So, the distribution problem, right? So, how do we? distribute the secrets? How do we stop people from seeing the secrets that they are not allowed to? How do we ensure the confidentiality is not compromised? 
as the secrets are being transmitted across the network, um, how do we share, who do we share the secrets with, who can see the secrets, ops, devs, DB admins, et cetera, um, and then how do we, who do we allow to read the secrets at runtime? What, how do you ensure your applications that are running on public cloud, on private cloud, on traditional um, uh, on-prem infrastructure, how can they consume the secrets at runtime? So, so that's kind of you know, a level of complexity there that Richard will talk about in a minute. Uh, <clears throat> and then we move to the secret life cycle problem. How do we rotate the secrets? How often do we rotate the secrets? So, so traditionally, um, the secrets had to be rotated on an annual basis, required a bit of downtime. You sort of you know, um, align your application's um, uh, patching cycle or some sort of maintenance window during which you rotate the secret, manually put the secret in the file, redeploy, restart, and all of that is done sort of traditionally quite manually, right? And it's quite intensive, again, um, uh, kind of, you know, open to lots of issues with sort of, you know, human error, et cetera, et cetera. So kind of, you know, that's where we have come from and how often do you rotate? Um, number of different um, applications, um, number, number of different types of secrets, AD secrets, database secrets, et cetera. How do you, how do you uh, ensure the, um, the kind of the, the service is not impacted when you, when you do that, right? So the impact of uh, rotating the secrets is high, especially when you don't know where those secrets are used. Uh, and we see that quite often. Secrets are shared across different environments and kind of, you know, a uh, number of those issues come up. The final point, uh, again, this is where um, a lot of, lot of our colleagues from banks and insurance companies would sort of resonate with, right? We have a massive governance um, task at hand to demonstrate who is using the secret, who has, where's the secret been used, um, is it strong, is it compliant, and when was last rotated, right? These are the sort of questions that we have to answer to our regulators. So I'm just going to pause there. Um, the secrets management issue is what you will get to eventually, whether you start in your CRCD journey, whether you start your infrastructure as core journey or your app dev journey. Until you solve this, you're basically building a house on sort of shaky foundations if you don't solve this, right? So it's quite fundamental, and that's kind of what we have discovered mm. in our journey. Right? Our, our, <clears throat> our initial journey, when I first met Hardeep, was about three years ago, and we were trying to do CICD, full automation from development, you know, from left to right. But we soon realized that the number of services we required in any, in an, any enterprise to be able to deploy in production, that everything needed individual credentials, secrets, and, and that's what actually where this, this strategy that we're talking to you about today came from, was that without secret management, you can't do full automation end to end. Correct. Right. <clears throat> So I'm um, just going to talk about a very simple business sort of workflow and example, and I'm hoping um, this is something that resonates with people, right? So how do we, uh, how do we go through that secret lifecycle um, sort of process today? So generally, a human raises a form for a type of secret that you need. That form goes to a, um, a specific team uh, to be provision, for example, a DBA, who will provision the secrets for you, and then those secrets are then passed via email or some sort of communication back to the developer. The developer would then take those secrets and put them in property files, guess where they put them, right? Um, I think a lot of those developers put those secrets in some sort of source code control systems, and then they deploy them at runtime where the applications then come up and read those secrets at runtime and use them to connect to downstream, upstream systems, right? So that's kind of this, the, the pattern we see. So can I sort of just get a raise of hands? Who can, can resonate with this? Who sort of, you know, who sees this is... So I see a couple of hands go up, right? So great. So I'm not alone. So sort of, you know, we, we're not alone in this, right? So which, is, which is great. So I'm uh, going to pass you to Richard, who's going to talk about the technology challenges. 
Yeah, so let, let's chat, right? For, for the last five years, personally, and many of the other uh, organizations I'm friends with in the financial sector, everybody you know, was using to public cloud, and obviously we've resided on hybrid cloud through a matter of just uh, organic growth, okay? And one of the, um, the key challenges with the, uh, with, when, with the hybrid model is, obviously every platform that I've been involved in has its own secret store. So the, the challenge we've got is with those secret stores, when we want to create those secrets today, we're going to have to have a workflow. Hardeep mentioned it earlier. Right? There's going to be a process for creating secrets in different platforms. These are all different technologies with different APIs. So we've got different workflows, different code bases, and it becomes very confusing for developers to know which process, which forms, and never mind maintain the code base. We also have um, a secret storage problem, okay? So all of these different environments have different secret stores themselves, okay? We obviously, you know, Amazon, you know, Amazon Secrets Manager, okay? Amazon Certificate Manager. Azure's got its own, and these are the common ones. Kubernetes has got um, Kubernetes Secrets, and all of our developers are having to code to each one of these and store things in different places. We also have, though, and I've seen this across all the sector, that people don't always store them in an appropriate secret store. People store them in Java key stores, right? The people store them in wiki pages. In the people base, I've caught, I've caught developers base 64 in passwords so they can sneak under the radar and put it into their code bases, right, in Stash, in, in, in Git. So the secret storage um, is a real challenge for us because there were so many different variants and so many different places that people were keeping secrets. It became really challenging for us to manage. When, we, when we've onboarded and when we created secrets, whether you know, database secrets, etc., the challenge we've got is I bet a lot of people still email secrets to the respective developers to then put into their applications. Now, obviously, email is not secure, and humans have already <laughs> know that password, so in essence, it's been compromised already. When, once we've created a, a, a credential, you know, how do we really know that who's accessing it, okay, who's using it, especially if a human scene or if it's in a code base that could be accessed by many people? What we, um, we have a couple of concepts I'd like to introduce you to that we've, we've talked about over the years, which is the first one is obviously the doormat problem. And we, we saw this systemically, um, and, I, and I've talked to my industry colleagues as well, it's, it's systemic in, in, the, in, in all organizations, that the doormat effect is when I've got a secret and I want to install it into my application or into my platform, how do I protect that secret? So generally people protect it with a, a doormat is the concept. So I protect it with you know, Java key store example. I put it into a key store to protect it, but then I've got a password to the key store. So how do I then protect the password to the key store? Oh, I'll protect it with an encryption key. What do I do with a private key for the encryption key? Right? So the doormat is, what is the acceptable layer, uh, layers of protection for that secret before it becomes acceptable for our controls and our security divisions? Okay? And that's the, that's the debate. And over my time, I've seen like three doormats, two, do you know, it's very different for different applications. The second construct I'd talk to you about is the secret zero problem. So when we've got that initial secret, so quite common to see people using a password to gain access to a password. So the secret zero is the original password that was then unlocked the uh, secret store to get access to the passwords. So one of the things I'll talk to you about in a few seconds is you know, how, how we and in the industry can look to solve that problem um, and, how, and how we can in initiate uh, computer identities. Okay, the secret life cycle. So obviously, most organizations probably use, does everybody use AD credentials? I'm sure system accounts for applications. It's quite systemic uh, in the organizations I've been involved in. And a lot of the time, those system accounts are quite difficult to create and quite onerous, and they're often used and shared across platforms. So if I was accessing a database, um, a Microsoft SQL database, I might share the same password across all of the clients. Obviously, that's a challenge because obviously if anyone's compromised or if we have to rotate, it impacts the whole of the cluster. All of the services that are using those credentials very difficult. And obviously, we've been driving to password rotation, yeah, more frequent rotation over many, many years now. But the problem is with, our, with a lot of manual applications or applications that deploy manually, when you change a password, you have to stop your applications. And if they're shared, it becomes very complicated. You have to stop everything, change the password, bring it up, very onerous. And obviously, as I said there, long-lived passwords are not great, so we want to reduce the uh, life of the password, so if it ever was compromised, the window, the sphere of privilege, the sphere of execution is, is reduced. 
So finally, the secret governance problem. We've talked about all these vaults everywhere, and, and security, how will they know what's accessed, who's accessing what, what secrets are where. Very difficult when it's stored in many, many places across all of the hybrid clouds. And they've all got different access logs. Very difficult for them to piece together and get a, 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 a good set of security intelligence about what, access, what data is being accessed. So let's get into some more interesting things, the target state. And <clears throat> so one of the things that we've seen and one of the ways that you can overcome this is the secret creation process. So in an enterprise, you'll always have a, a system of record. And we used to um, create, um, and a lot of organizations used to create <clears throat> secrets and map them to humans as an ownership. So there was accountability. The problem is humans move on. Humans move teams. So what, one of the options that you get is you can map secrets to an application because secrets for infrastructure are generally related to applications. So what we do is we can, you can map to an application and an application would be a, <clears throat> a construct in your system of record. And then you can have application managers and developers who own that application. It's like an indirection. Okay, so basically I'm recommending that you map app secrets to applications. And then once you've done that, you can use modern um, technologies, um, identity services. So the humans who log on to, the, to request secrets, you can actually map the humans to what applications they manage. So it's called attribute-based access control, ABAC, okay? So when you log on to a, sol a solution, you can say, I am, um, I am an administrator, a manager of these applications, and that will be my entitlement. So JWT with a claim, for example, would be an example of that. Then when you log on to the onboarding process, a single onboarding portal, you can create your secrets or permission to create dynamic secrets, which I'll touch on in a second. You can actually create them, and it's all based on what you are and the applications that you own versus a traditional role-based access control model, which is quite, uh, quite modern and been very successful. We talked about all these vaults. It would be good to try and standardize on a single vault technology so all of your application code as you deploy it across hybrid cloud can all make the same API calls, the same processes, simplify your code base. The key here is obviously don't create one vault. That, would be, you know, that wouldn't be very good. You want to create a scalable, federated secret store solution because you don't want to create a bottleneck by centralizing this critical secret service. Secret consumption, this is another really, really important part. Um, <clears throat> so, with all these different platforms, AWS, Kubernetes, uh, VMware, Azure, just as examples on my slide, all of the modern cloud providers have the ability for infrastructure and applications, right, entities or resources, to be able to create a computer identity. So that they, and this is the secret zero problem, so when they instantiate, then they will be able to identify who they are and there'll be some way of verifying that they are who they are from the, from the uh, provider, from the platform provider. VMware with the red dot here was very, very challenging. VMware doesn't provide an identity for any VMs that are launched. It is possible though with either Chef or with Ansible to create an identity within those platforms or um, it is possible with the use of Kerberos and using a, your system of record again and, a, and an independent third party, you can validate from Linux and Windows on VMware and you can create a computer identity. So though, though there isn't one out of the box, it is possible to do. So that means you can have a computer identity to solve that secret zero. So what you can do is with your system of records, you can bind that identity to the application that that infrastructure is bound to. So when the infrastructure asks for a secret, when it wants to consume a secret, it will be able to connect to the secrets management system and inside it will have, I am a member of this application, so your access control can be based on which infrastructure can access what secret. Nothing to do with humans at this point. The distribution problem, when a computer, one of these cloud platforms here or, or on-premise cloud platform accesses a secret, then obviously we want to try and move to dynamic secrets, right? No long-lived AD credentials, right? We're trying to move away from AD credentials actually nowadays. An AD credential, by the way, is a blast radius if it was compromised, has the main users generally by default. That is a, a, a huge sphere of privilege in an organization. So by moving to, so we're going back in time really to more ephemeral, short-lived secrets and especially local secrets within the application, then we're able to, to improve the security position. When the uh, clients consume the secrets, the key is as well, we don't want to store it at rest, we want to store it in memory. 
Okay, so only use it ephemerally, very short lived. So you can use memory variables um, in, in shell, for example, or you can use your application constructs to be able to just cache that for the duration. By not sharing secrets as well, means that individual applications, so that we're promoting that every single service would have its own individual, wouldn't share passwords anymore, okay, or any secrets. Every individual service that's instantiated would create its own unique secret, so it can be rotated in its own appropriate time. So behind the scenes, we would look to leverage lots of integrations with applications and creating these dynamic secrets, okay? Here, so we've got database, you can log into AD and you can create AD users on demand now that are per service, rather than have a single user that's shared across many services. I'll just quickly touch on it, PKI. A lot of great work in PKI. You're able to do a PKI um, certificates and private keys are just another secret. secret it, the word secret covers a lot of different constructs. Um, so it's this all supported for PKI as well. Finally, because we've got a single vault, we've got all this governance around who can create secrets, who can access secrets, and now we've got this single technology stack that allows us to report on who is consuming secrets and what's active. We've got the governance piece ticked off, so the security teams are very, very happy now. Yeah, <clears throat> so that's you know, wonderful, right? So uh, what sort of, you know, are these sort of things that you need to watch out for along this journey? Uh, obviously, it comes, you know, covers the three pillars, the, the process people and technology. The processes are generally in our large organizations are geared towards what people have done before, what all of the governance and reporting teams have always done. So the processes need to change to pivot to what Richard just spoke about when the dynamic secrets are created, how do you then report the same to your assurance, for your assurance to your external or internal regulators, right? And that sort of, you know, that, that process pivot is quite a mind shift, right? And, and that also is a bit of a mind shift for people who the CISOs and, and the other security, IAM governance and, and, you know, crypto teams, sort of, you know, for them to get their head round, <laughs> Ephemer ephemerality of secrets is quite a quantum leap, right? So uh, I'll give you an example. We were really excited um, um, kind of you know, talk about one of, the, um, one of the patterns we were implementing or looking to design with um, for break glass type of secrets where ephemeral secrets could be used for database credentials. Um, and one of the governance teams kind of, you know, um, had their head... Um, uh, you know, hands on their head saying, oh, how am I going to report all of the secrets that are ephemeral to my regulators? And you kind of have to take a step back and it's a bit of an education you have to take your teams through to say, well, actually, that's not what you report. You report the ability to generate the credentials and, and that role is what you sort of certify on a regular basis to say, this is something that I can do or my application can do and as opposed to these specific secrets or, or credentials that were created. So, so it's, it is a bit of a quantum leap, right? It's a bit of a jump in, in mind shift, but that is sort of the job that you have to do as, as a transformation team to bring the organizations to the cloud world, right? Because this is um, very, very different to um, how people are used to uh, uh, working before. Um, and then the technology, right? So how do you take your application teams through the journey of refactoring their applications? How, because they have to make some changes to sort of, you know, um, use a different type of all technologies, different um, credential types, and, and using kind of, you know, moving from long-lived secrets to short-term secret, uh, dynamic secrets. How do, you, how do you take them on that journey? Not all applications can consume the best practices. How do you how do you work with the COTS type applications? As long as they can read a secret from a file, you can do that, right? So, so there are ways to achieve that as well. So um, it is not uh, insurmountable, uh, it is doable. And then kind of, you know, um, uh, how do you ensure the priority of the work is uh, managed for the application teams to focus on sort of, you know, cyber piece of work, right? And this sort of falls into that. And how do you leverage your... Um, um, uh, governance teams and control functions to, to sort of you know, drive the organization to adopt a modern way uh, of managing your credentials and secrets. 
Okay. Comes. Yeah, so all I'll say, I've had a lot of resistance from development teams myself when adopting this model. Um, when someone has a two-year long secret that they only rotate once every two years and then you're trying to get them to change all their code to do it dynamically every 15 days, there is a resistance and that's been one of the biggest challenges. But once they've, they've onboarded and we've shown them the code and we've given them the coding patterns, then the teams realize they never need to rotate. It, but there is an inertia um, and it's difficult, but you, it, is, it is possible. But it, it does result in a lot less overhead on your ops teams who yeah traditionally have to do this, manage these outages in production, and they don't have to do that anymore because they can now see everything is done automatically, and then suddenly that's one less thing for them to manage the certificate rotations, the AD credential rotations, key tab generation, all that kind of stuff, sort of can go away if you manage that properly. Yeah. Okay. So where should you aim, aim to get to? So, as I said before, you're using a central secrets management solution like Vault, yeah, make sure it's not a single point of failure. So one of our premises is that we haven't put any abstraction in between the customer and the secret store. We've made it so it's as simple as possible and as highly available as possible. And we have federated that solution across multiple cloud providers so that we can offer that availability and regions actually as well. Um, so it's really important because that was the biggest pushback I got from in the cloud world because obviously everyone using their local cloud secret store means that they've sort of got, they're coupled less to the other platforms. Okay, so that's one of the big, big pushbacks you get from the application teams. But, um, and finally, yeah, you know, we, we started with simple use cases and we've moved all the way out through databases and PKI, as we said. So you just start with the most common use cases, the biggest problem areas, and as you work through your uh, secrets backlog, uh, and we're still on that journey. Thank you, guys. Thank you.